Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we've got part two of Nathan Oakley's Flat Earth Housekeeping Questions. We're going to be dealing with gas pressure without a container, evidence of a molten iron core for the Earth, and evidence of axial rotation. So if you'll join me, we'll go through these and then I'm going to repeat my invitation to both Quantum Eraser and Nathan Oakley to come to my channel for a debate. Well, the next one's pretty easy as well. Any gas pressure next to a vacuum? Well, there's three examples of it right there. Now, the top two planets, of course, are Saturn and Jupiter, and anybody with a decent telescope or sometimes even a P900 camera can actually see the atmosphere of these planets, especially Jupiter with that red spot. And every night on the weather, we see weather reports from satellites on Earth, and there's an actual film photograph of the Earth from space. It kind of shows curvature, too. But just for thoroughness, we can measure atmospheric pressure on Earth. We can measure a pressure gradient. We can create a pressure gradient using a heavy gas like butane. These are not difficult experiments, and any of us can do them. I mean, we use barometric pressure every single day. How do you think a barometer works? You know, the obvious analogy that none of the people on the flat Earth like to talk about is a swimming pool. We know that the pressure at the bottom of a swimming pool is higher than the pressure at the surface of the swimming pool. So why doesn't that pressure just explode into the air? It's because there's something acting on that water, just as there's something acting on the atmosphere, and that's gravity. Ah, the infamous, is there any proof of the radius of the Earth? You know, as a matter of fact, Blue Marble Science and I actually measured the radius and the circumference of the Earth from two different locations more than 500 miles apart during the last spring equinox. This is not difficult to do. Any of you can do it. All you need is a stick and a tape measure. It's very simple to do. Now, if you want to plan a flight and calculate the distance between any two points on Earth, you can do that using the radius of the Earth. However, if you don't know what the radius of the Earth, but you do know the distance between those two points, you can back calculate it and determine the radius of the Earth. Simply using a sextant to determine the distance along a single line of longitude between two lines of latitude is another way to find out how many miles it is per degree, and then simply multiply that by 360 to get the circumference of the Earth, and then you can calculate the radius directly from that. And then, of course, the Islamic astronomer Al-Biruni determined a method of calculating the radius of the Earth simply by looking at the drop in the horizon from a mountain of known elevation using an astrolabe. You know, guys, this is actually pretty easy to do. Blue Marble Science and I did it ourselves during the uh, March equinox this year. All you need to do is know where the sun is over the Earth. And on the equinox, it's over the equator. Then you just measure a shadow at solar noon and calculate the degrees. It's pretty simple. Now, one cool thing about this is you can also triangulate the distance to the sun in the same manner. You have an angle to the sun, you have a known distance on a leg, and then you have an angle like my 45 degree for the flagpole. All you have to do is run the numbers and you'll find out how far away the sun is. If the sun comes up in the same location, the earth is flat. If it comes up in different locations, the earth is most definitely not flat, it's curved. Guess what? The sun came up in two different locations for us because we were 500 miles apart. Well, the next question, very much like how do you determine the distance to the sun, requires a little bit of deductive reasoning. And that is, how do we know that the Earth has got a molten iron core? Well, our first indication that the Earth had a molten iron core came from Lord Henry Cavendish. Recall that his experiment was not designed to quantify gravity but to take advantage of gravity to determine the density of the Earth. Now, when he did determine the density of the Earth, he found that the density of the Earth was much closer to that of iron than it was to that of stone. And that was the first real indication that there was a huge amount of iron in the core of the Earth. 
The next clue was using seismic waves. It was discovered that S waves from earthquakes only traveled through solid material that did not travel through liquid material. So by plotting the location of earthquakes and looking at the pattern of S waves from those earthquakes, we could tell that there was a shadow in the middle of the earth that suggested there was a liquid solid interface. In a similar manner, P waves from earthquakes could go through both liquids and solids, but were refracted in a very predictable pattern as they went from solid to liquid and then from liquid to solid. Again, by studying P waves from earthquakes located all over the world, we discovered that there was a rocky mantle, there was a liquid core, and a solid inner core, and we're actually able to determine the sizes and thicknesses of those three layers. Uh, as a side benefit of this, given the fact the pattern was similar throughout the world from earthquakes anywhere in the world, there was only one geometric pattern that would have fit it, and that is that of a sphere. Now one of the problems that you run into with flat earth is they like to maintain this attitude that unless you have actually drilled all the way to the center of the earth, you can't possibly know what it is. Well, that's not really true because I can't go down and look at these fish because if I jump in the water with my snorkeling gear, I'm going to scare the fish away. I, I can't see them anymore. But by using technology and properly interpreting it, I know where the fish are, I know how deep the lake is, and so do you. Now the next one's probably the easiest one to prove, and that is, is there any sign of axial rotation? Of course there is. You know, we can sit down and talk about weight differentials due to centrifugal force at the equator. We can talk about the Foucault pendulum. We can talk about sunrise, sunset. There are many things that we can talk about, but let's just cut right to the chase. The mechanical gyro compass gyroscopically finds true north based on the rotation of the Earth, period. And then we can directly measure the rotation of the Earth using a laser ring gyro. They're really no longer up to debate. Two things are very important to point out. First, with a gyro compass, a mechanical gyro compass and a gyroscopic heading indicator are two different things. Specifically, a gyroscopic heading indicator is indeed a gyroscopic instrument in an aircraft. However, it needs to be set to a magnetic heading by reference to a magnetic compass. It then uses the gyroscope to hold that heading. That is very different than a gyro compass which once spun up finds its own heading, specifically True North. Quantum Eraser and Nathan Oakley like to try and confuse these two instruments, but they are different instruments that do different things. The next source of confusion is the ring laser gyroscope. The ring laser gyroscope measures rotation in one axis. Now, for something like an inertial reference system on an aircraft, they employ three laser ring gyros set at right angles to each other to determine rotation in pitch, roll, and yaw. If you set this up on your desk, it will sense the rotation of that desk on the surface of the Earth. It doesn't care about the shape of the Earth. All it cares about is whether or not it is rotating. It does that by sensing that rotation, not through ether or magic pixie dust or flat earth narratives. It is a laser interferometer and it operates on the Sagnac effect. It just knows that it's rotating or that it's not rotating. It doesn't care about anything else. Well guys, about this debate, here's the terms. Nathan, you and Quantum Eraser can come to my channel and debate me on any one of the six housekeeping questions that I just demolished. If you want to use citations, you're going to provide those to me in advance so I can read them. You're not just going to get to spring them on me. If you haven't provided them to me, you don't get to use them. Now, why on my channel? Well, two reasons. One, I have an awful lot more viewers than you do, Nathan. Even though my channel has only been out for eight months, I pretty much have as many subscribers as you do and considerably more views. So I want this seen, so we're going to do it here. Second, you have a history of using your mute button and using your volume control to shout over your guests to try and give yourself an advantage in a debate. You're not going to get to do that here. 
Now, if you agree, I want you to go to my About page and send me an email. The address is right there. Anthony Riley has my email address. But contact me and we will make the arrangements at a time that is mutually convenient for all three of us. So, until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you all very much for stopping by. Hey, make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there in the right lower corner. And if you get a chance, stop by Nathan Oakley 1980. See whether or not he wants to come debate me. Leave him a little note in his comments on his videos. And keep doing it until he acknowledges it one way or the other. And by the way, thank you very much, Nathan, for taking me off mute and server block. I see that my comments are coming up a little bit more now. You had me on block. I did call you on that, and then all of a sudden the next day it changed. So, anytime you want to do it, bring it. Mm -hmm.